Good morning to everybody. Happy Sunday and welcome. Uh, we are certainly glad for each one that's here for you taking the time to listen to this morning's lesson. Uh, today we're talking about Christian epistles. Uh, and like Steve said, this is a lesson about influence. It's about the nature of Christianity and about the spread of the church. Uh, God's design that uh, Christian men and women would go forward and make other Christian men and women. Uh, and I appreciate Steve sharing the story, the history of that song, Let the Lower Lights Be Burning. Uh, and now we all know what the upper lights are. Uh, that's God. That's His call, reaching out through the gospel. Uh, now God's plan for success, His recipe for the church, is that His call would be accompanied by ours. That His influence to draw people to Him would be accompanied by our influence drawing people to Him. Uh, now, the key verse that we're looking at uh, describes an epistle, but first we need to say, uh, what is an epistle? Uh, don't go for that old joke, the wife of an apostle is an epistle. That's not it at all. An epistle is a letter, uh, specifically a, a writing directed or sent to a person or group of people. And as we look to the New Testament, uh, these are for the purpose of teaching. Uh, now, as followers of God, you and I, we have a responsibility to teach others, like we said, to call them to Christ. Uh, and as Paul here speaks about his relationship with the church and the future of it, the body, he teaches that members of the church are, in a sense, epistles. Uh, so you look to 2 Corinthians 3. If you notice in verse 2 and 3, he says, You are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Clearly, you are an epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God not on tables of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is, of the heart. Uh, now this is an amazing passage for me because you get to see powerful imagery. Uh, and we could talk a lot about different images used in the Bible to talk about Christians. You're familiar with Ephesians 6, the armor of God. Uh, we're Christian soldiers. Uh, soldiers of Christ arise, as we sometimes sing. Uh, we also see the church described many places as a, a building. Uh, Christ being the chief cornerstone of that building. Uh, we see the church as the bride of Christ and that husband-wife relationship. But I wonder if you've considered or thought about how Christians are letters. Christians are epistles. Uh, now, as we look to the New Testament, we find many of these are letters from Paul. Uh, we also see epistles that are authored by Peter, by James, Jude, and others. But the ultimate author of all of these, of course, would be God. Uh, they're inspired by the Holy Spirit. You look specifically at some of the wording here in this, in this passage. In verse 2, he says, you are our epistle. Uh, talking about Christians there in Corinth, he says, you are our letter, uh, our message to, to teach and for the benefit of the world to influence them and draw them. But I think verse 3 is even more powerful in its imagery because it says, clearly you are an epistle of Christ. Uh, imagine our Lord sitting down writing a letter to the lost. But it's not a letter like written on parchment, not written, on, uh, not written with ink, but instead written on you and me. Uh, we are the letter that Christ pins to the world. We are that message, that teaching, that directive going out as uh, a representation of His teaching uh, and of His will for mankind. Uh, and so here are all the ways that, that I could think of to kind of describe this and lay out a good lesson. Uh, how are we like epistles and what do we know about epistles? Uh, so part one, uh, we need to talk about changed material. Epistles are written on changed material and in order for us to have influence, you and I must be changed material. Uh, think for a minute back to ancient writing materials. We, we mentioned parchment, uh, some idea of prepared animal skins. You think of vellum and the like. Uh, more common for this day and age, papyrus. Uh, that paper made from the pith of the papyrus plant. Uh, go back even further, you can see clay tablets and, and even stone. But what all these things have in common, they are changed materials. They have to be prepared for the task, set apart for a specific work, not as they're found naturally, but as they're made artificially for man's use. That's how the letters function. Well, if we're going to be those messages from Christ, if we're going to be Christian epistles, we have to be changed from our former state to a new state. Uh, you can see this in many places. I'm going to start in Psalm 19 and verse 7. Psalm 19 and verse 7 says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Uh, and let me just highlight for us the word converting. Uh, 
That's what we're talking about, to be changed material, to be converted, to be changed. Uh, And you can see how it's described here, the law of the Lord, His teaching, His directive, His commandments for us. It is perfect because it changes the truest part of us, our soul, that part given uniquely to man. We talked a little bit about that in Bible class. Uh, The soul breathed by God. Uh, And then you can see the second part of that verse, the testimony of the Lord, it is sure. Uh, In other words, we can be confident in it, be well assured of its truth, and it makes wise the simple. Uh, Those who have not yet come to Christ, they haven't been converted. They haven't been changed. Uh, Those of us who have obeyed the gospel, have become Christians, we're working through this process of becoming wise by looking to God's word rather than by looking to man's wisdom, that lesser wisdom. Uh, Jesus himself taught about this in a couple of different occasions. You can look to Matthew 18, here from verse 2 and 3. Uh, this is a popular passage, and I think it's fitting because we've got some extra little people here today. Matthew 18, 2 and 3. And then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Uh, well, what do we know about little children? They're innocent. And as you look to little children and their example growing up, you can see that they love easily and freely, that they're very trusting. And this is the model that we see for the church. Jesus says, be like these little children. And he uses that same word to be converted. Uh, Not just to take away the guilt and the stains of sin by coming to Christ, by being washed in Him, uh, but to have that loving outlook, that tender mindset that is so necessary when you talk about being a follower of Him. Uh, And as we talk about being changed material, I have to throw in a word of caution here. Because I think where a lot of people miss it is they say, oh, okay, I'll be changed material, but they just worry about how they're perceived. They just worry about the outside. So they would say something like, I have to seem like I'm changed. Well, no, this is a hard issue, and it has to go all the way through. Not converted just on the outside, but converted all the way to the innermost parts. A little bit further on in Matthew's account of the Gospel, Matthew 23 here from 27 and 28, one of the rebukes that Jesus had of the religious leaders. Matthew 23, 27 and 28, he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness." Now, you remember, we're talking about influence. In order for me to influence people for Christ, I need to be changed material. And this scripture, as well as others we could look to, point to the truth that it has to be a complete change, full conversion, not just the outside. That veneer of Christianity is not going to cut it. We won't have the influence God designed us to. We won't be able to uh, let those lower lights shine and guide people to God's safety. It has to be a complete transformation. You can see, especially in verse 28, as he highlights their hypocrisy, he said, you outwardly appear righteous, but inside, what is there? Lawlessness. And the picture of that, the dead men's bones, all uncleanness. He says, you're so pure on the crust, on the outside, on the walls, but inside, so impure, so corrupted, so stained by sin and the wickedness of the world. That can't describe us as the church. If it does, our influence is gone. Uh, You know, this idea of being changed material, it's very closely related to the idea of true repentance. Uh, You can see this in Acts 3 and verse 19. Acts 3.19 says, Repent therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Uh, Now first we do see that Uh, idea to repent. We have to talk about that. It's a change of mind, heart, and action. Uh, To be a change material, you'll say, no longer living for the world, no longer following after my own passions, no longer serving Satan. Uh, Now I will serve the Lord. I have a different focus, a different desire, different aims and goals for myself and for my family. Uh, But it's more than just that because we need to see the source of it. How am I going to be change material? Can I do it by myself? Can I change myself? Can I convert myself, make myself clean? Where does this cleansing, where does this refreshing come from? It comes from Jesus. In order to be changed material, we must come to Him. 
That's what this conversion process highlighted over and over in the Bible is talking about. And so don't go about that wasted time trying to change yourself. Come to Christ who enables that change. Uh, your sins to be blotted out in the last part of verse 19 so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Uh, that's where we find the source. That's where we find our ability to be changed material. Uh, and if we truly are converted, a new manner of living, not after the old way of sin, but the new way called according to God's purpose, living for the kingdom, we can have great influence. We can be Christian epistles as we're designed to be. Uh, part two, what do we know about epistles? They are from the author. Uh, and you remember, this is back to the definition. An epistle is a letter. Epistles carry a message from a unique author. And in order to have influence, we must be from our author. Uh, you know, different epistles we can look to and say, well, this is clearly a writing of Paul. Uh, you know, the Holy Spirit using his background, his personality, his education, and his writing, it bears the mark of the author. And you can say, I can tell by looking at this that it's from Paul. Well, as Christians, people should tell by looking to us, by observing uh, that we are following our author, that we understand Christ. Uh, you know, it's, it's becoming more of a rare thing to get snail mail, you know, a paper letter, and it's special. Uh, you see it and you get it and you say, ah, who's this from? Uh, you know, if it doesn't look immediately like junk mail, what do you do? You check that return address. Who sent me a letter? Who's the author? And then immediately you're excited to open and receive that message uh, designed for your good. Uh, well, who is our author? Of course, Jesus. Hebrews 12 and verse 2 lays this out in a very powerful way. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Uh, now it says, looking unto Jesus. That's, that's New King James. Uh, the New American Standard and a few other versions have this a, a bit more clearly. Uh, it is fixing our eyes upon Jesus. It's not just that we're looking to Him. We are decidedly looking away from everything which is not Jesus. So fixing our eyes upon Him. Why? Because He's the author. Uh, he is the source. He is the originator. Uh, and you can take just a minute to, to think about this, and it, it does kind of fall in line with where we were in class talking about uh, free will and about God's creation. Jesus is the author of everything in us that is good. Uh, you know, you can think back to creation as described in the book of Genesis. Uh, God saw everything that the Son made, and it was very good. Uh, but then where we come in with our free will, with our determination to rebel against God, sin. That, of course, is bad, but Jesus is not the author of that. We're using our free will to choose that. But then you move forward to come to Him for regeneration by faith, to come for Him uh, for forgiveness of sins. That's very, very good. And then the continued service, living for the kingdom, being diligent, obedient followers of God, is very, very good. And Jesus is the author of everything in us that is good, that is holy, that is pure. Uh, Philippians 2 and verse 5 lays it out very simply... Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Or if you allow the paraphrase, be like your author. Be like the one who set you up for good. Be like the one who designed you. Be like the one who executed God's design for creation. Uh, specifically, in chapter 2 of Philippians, the mind of Christ is one of humble service. Uh, we see Him showing time and again loving compassion even to those who are unthankful, even to those who are evil. He shows that agape love, that self-sacrificing love. And in this we see, of course, He is the ultimate example for us. Uh, if we are to have influence in this world for Christ, we have to put on Christ. Uh, we have to allow others to see Christ living in us. Uh, that's what Paul details in Galatians 2 and verse 20, a uh, passage I know we're all familiar with, because uh, we sing it. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Now think about this idea, Christ living in us. And that's exactly what it means to be that Christian epistle, to be from the author that people would know Christ is living through us. Well, how is that done? Well, in order for people to recognize that, we have to continue the ministry which our Lord began. That service of teaching, of doing good, of helping others, uh, bringing them 
to forgiveness of sins, bringing them to ultimately that eternal heavenly home. And that done based on pure Christian doctrine, not the traditions of men, not the opinions and and passions and lusts of the world. It's only done by the power of the gospel. If we're continuing in that work, we have Christ living in us. Uh, Now, one more on on this idea, and this is my favorite passage for this. If you look to Acts 4, uh, there in verse 13, you've got Peter and John, and this, of course, is after Acts 2. It's after the beginning of the church. Christ is already ascended. And, you know, those religious leaders who thought, hey, we're we're finally done with Jesus. You know, we didn't do so great, but we've kind of finished that. Uh, Aren't we glad it's all gone? Well, it's not because of Christian epistles, because of Jesus' followers. Uh, And here's the the best thing, because we get to see the enemies of Christ really promoting the cause, or at least uh, speaking to its good. Acts 4.13, here's the religious leaders, the Jewish council. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. And this last sentence is what's so beautiful. And they realized that they had been with Jesus. This is recognizing that they're from the author. These are people who are familiar with Jesus because they were so frustrated by him. They plotted to kill him and ultimately succeeded in that. Uh, But of course he rose from the dead. They recognized something in Peter and John. They said, these guys aren't aren't educated. They're just those poor fishermen. They're Galileans. These guys aren't trained to, to come and speak like this. But when they spoke, they heard that boldness. The same that when Jesus spoke with, the crowds marveled. They said, Never a man spoke like this. He speaks with authority, not as the scribes. He speaks with authority from heaven. And so, teaching that same message, continuing that ministry, they realize they had been with Jesus. Wouldn't it be beautiful if this could be said of every one of us? Whether it's a friend or a foe to the cross, that they would look at us, at our life, at our teaching, at our example, and they would say, you're with Jesus. I can't help but recognize that. Even people opposed to our Lord say, you're like Him. That's a beautiful thing. Uh, Now, it can become, I think, a a very challenging thing. Uh, There was one who put it this way, to see a true Christian is to see Christ. To see a false Christian is to see a sinner. Now, the question is, can others see Christ in me? Uh, There's a lot of ways to take that. As we would all challenge ourselves, take the hard look in the mirror. Uh, Can others see Christ in my speech? Can others see Christ in my dress? Can others see Christ in what I do, in where I go, in my attitude? There are so many little ways each and every day that you can make a difference. That you can have a powerful impact. That you can influence someone for good. Bring them to a greater knowledge and appreciation of all-powerful truth from an all-powerful God. But you know, just as true as that is, we need to acknowledge influence can also go the other way. Something we say, something we do, just a little thing that doesn't seem like much to us can do a lot of harm to someone else, can turn them off from the truth, can lead them away rather than bringing them closer to Christ and accepting His teaching, living according to His teaching. Influence is powerful. We have to be, each and every day, from our author. We have to be Christ-like in everything that we do. Uh, Part three, as we talk about these Christian epistles, they're designed to help. Uh, And this is a small statement. I know it's a simple one, but it goes pretty deep. Uh, Epistles are written to help others, and in order to have influence, we must do good. We must help others. Think about the letters we have in the New Testament. Paul, Peter, James, other human writers, God is using all of them to write helpful things. Uh, Some of what's contained there, instructions for growing in the faith, instructions for living out our faith, uh, actions of good that follow the example of Christ. And these epistles, you know, it's not just to write helpful things, but to write God's command that His followers must help others, that we have to continue in that work to be about the good in others. Uh, Look to 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 24. And there Paul writing says, Let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. This is a powerful principle. Uh, It's one of those things I think of, you know, very easy to read, maybe very difficult to live, uh, or at least to live consistently. Uh, It kind of fits in with that mindset that says, God first, others second, myself last. 
there's humble service that's seen here. Uh, and it's, it's powerful to, to influence someone to see that you care about them. Uh, that matters to people, to see that you're invested in them, that you're willing to work for their good, asking nothing in return. And that's part of the agape love that's there. Uh, one Bible commentator talking about this passage, uh, he said, Let every man live not for himself, but for every part of the great human family with which we are surrounded. Uh, are we living for others? Are we lifting them up? Are we serving others? Uh, are we helping them? Are we doing good like our Lord did? Uh, in Matthew 12 and verse 35, uh, we do get to see how it's a hard issue again. Matthew 12:35 says, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. Uh, to do good, to help, that's part of our design. That's how God made us. So the only question is, are we functioning as we're designed to do? Or do we have a heart problem? Uh, you know, you go in for a checkup, all these different tests are run, and they say, uh, well, your heart's just not functioning like we'd like it to. Uh, well, is there a good heart or an evil heart? What's coming out of it? Uh, is there a good treasure that's coming forth to do good things? Are we involved in helping others? Are we there following again the example of our Lord? Uh, Romans 15, there in verse 1 and 2, says, We then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. Then verse 2, Let each one of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. Uh, this is such a beautiful concept when you talk about edification. Uh, it really is building up to show care, to encourage, uh, to lift up one another. Uh, and you think about meeting the need. Uh, you know, every letter in the New Testament meets a need. And oftentimes as we're studying them, we, we kind of make distinctions. And you say, well, this is mentioned over here in 1 Corinthians, not talked about so much in Colossians. Why? Well, because God, through these writers, is meeting a specific need. Well, so if we are Christian epistles, letters from Christ, we need to meet the need. Uh, meet the need of others, our neighbor, our brother and sister, our Christian friend, uh, our acquaintance, the person that we happen to meet. Are we going to do something to establish and increase their spiritual light or something to take away, something to diminish? Because it seems like it's always one or the other. Uh, and then the last verse under this one, uh, Galatians 6 and verse 10. Uh, it's one we reference a lot. It's, it's a powerful verse. Galatians 6, 10, Therefore, as we have opportunity... Let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Uh, and I know a lot of times we come to this verse and we talk about the meaning of all. Let us do good to all. And then we have that added at the end, especially those of the household of faith. Uh, I want to take a minute just to, to give you a different focus here. Uh, just look at the word opportunity. Uh, at the start of this verse, therefore, as we have opportunity. Uh, because I, I think a mistake a lot of Christians make and and I've been there, if I'm honest, before, I look at as we have opportunity and I think, well, it might come around every so often. You know, look at it, look at it as a rare thing, really. As we have opportunity, I might have an opportunity every once in a while. I don't think that's the way we need to look at it at all. Uh, our understanding should be there are opportunities every day and many opportunities every day. Uh, it's not to say if you happen to find that rare opportunity, it's almost to say, since we have so many opportunities, let us do good to all. Seeing that we have so many doors open to us, seeing that God gives us so many chances and, and puts so many people in our path and puts us in the path of so many people, let's do good to all. Let's fulfill our design. Let's function as we're meant to, to help, to edify, to build up, to do good for others. Uh, you know, when Jesus walked to the earth during His ministry here, he didn't stop and, and say, well, I might have a time just once a month or so to go and help someone. A rare opportunity, but I might have an opportunity to, to do good. No, he found opportunities every day and it seems like every hour of every day and multiple times. You can see through different accounts in the gospel where Jesus is on his way to do something good and he does three good things on his way to do that. I wish I could live like that. As we have opportunity to do good, let's do it to all. And that's certainly what our Lord did. Uh, now part four, and this, this is the last one I want to talk about, but in some ways it's the most important. Uh, epistles need to be easily read. Uh, you know, these letters, they're, they're only useful if they can be read. And in order to have influence, you and I must be easily read. Uh, now as far as our illustration goes, there's a couple of ways to think about it. Uh, Paul and others wrote in a language 
that his first readers understood. Uh, you know, the first recipients of the letter, they could pick it up, they say, ah, Corne Greek, I know that, I can read that, here we go. Uh, but also, he didn't write with the biggest, most complex vocabulary he knew. He wrote in a way they could understand. Uh, even those without higher learning, even those who didn't sit at the feet of the best Jewish scholars, they could understand what was being said. He wanted to communicate clearly. Now, on the other side, consider also that ancient writing materials could be very fragile. Uh, and clear communication required that the letter not become damaged. Uh, and it would be very easily for some, uh, some of these things to be smudged, torn, burned, faded, to the point of being unreadable. And that's why we see copies immediately being made of all of these things, so that they can be preserved for the church. Uh, now the question, looking to us as Christian epistles, are we too high in our complex language and vocabulary to be understood? Uh, are we speaking in a way that people aren't going to find clear, relatable? And then also, are we damaged? Are we smudged, torn, blotted, burned, and faded to the point where we can't be easily read, where our influence suffers? Uh, look first to James 1 and verse 27. James 1, 27 says, Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Uh, now this too is a, a powerful passage describing the church and it's one where we need to see just, just everything that's said there. Don't take one part of this and run away with it. Pure religion, religion that is undefiled, is described with two great things right here. First off is to visit the less fortunate. He mentions orphans and widows uh, to care for them in their time of trouble but just as much attached to pure and undefiled is that phrase at the end, to keep oneself unspotted from the world. And this is a powerful warning to me and you and, and everyone who wants to follow Christ. If I am spotted by the world, if I am corrupted, my influence goes away. I can't be a good Christian epistle. I can't be easily read. I can't influence others for Christ if I am damaged by the wickedness of the world still present in my life. Uh, you look to Titus 2, there from verse 6 down to verse 8. Um, Paul writing to Titus says, Likewise, exhort the young men to be sober-minded in all things, showing yourself to be, a, uh, to be a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say of you. Uh, now you look to that idea to be incorruptible, that's to be unspotted from the world. Uh, to be easily read because there's no wickedness getting in the way. You're not living a hypocritical lifestyle where people say, I, I hear what you're saying, but I see what you're doing, and it just doesn't match. It just doesn't fit. Uh, influence is powerful when it's not corrupted, when it's not worn down. Uh, and then maybe the best passage to, to talk about this idea, Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Uh, and this is just after he talks about influence with the other picture there, which is salt. But with both salt and light, Jesus talks about how that influence can be lost if it's corrupted, if it's damaged. Uh, the salt loses its saltiness. Uh, or think about the light, that doesn't shine out. Uh, imagine the, the old-timey lantern, right? And it's been used, it's been burning, but that soot has gathered on those glass panes in the case around the lantern. Well, if you don't clean it, it doesn't matter how bright your light is inside that lantern, it's not shining through. It's damaged. It's not easily read. Uh, or the way we sometimes sing this little light of mine, the second verse of that, hide it under a bushel. Uh, well, if you've got it under that basket there, it's not shining out. Its light can't be seen. The influence is lost. So we say, no, I'm going to let it shine. That's the idea exactly. Uh, you think about the light described here in Matthew 5, I think the best way to think about it Imagine a mirror, right? Because we don't have light in and of ourselves. It's not that we're so holy. It's not that we're so beautiful. But Christians reflect the light of Christ as a mirror can be used to redirect light. But if our mirrors are all tarnished, dirty, spoiled, damaged, cracked, we're not as able to do that. We've lost that power to influence. We can't very well reflect that pure light. Uh, and so once again, we need to come to Jesus to follow His example, to remain pure, to be easily read, 
to have influence as good Christian epistles. And of course, we say again that that cleansing uh, starts with Christ. Uh, Revelation 1 there in verse 5, part of the opening of that book, has a little title explaining Jesus, giving a little uh, divine attributes there. Revelation 1, 5, from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler over the kings of the earth, and you notice the phrase after that, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. I'm able to be a good mirror because of the washing of Christ. We're able to be clean lanterns that shine that light because of the washing of Jesus Christ. This is the power to keep that corruption out, to keep ourselves unspotted, to stick close to Him so that we can be easily read, so that we can have that influence, so that it's not damaged by our hypocrisy trying to preach the message of Jesus and live the life of the world. To remain consistent, remain with Christ, have that influence. Now let's go back to where we started. 2 Corinthians 3 uh, here in verse 2 and 3, Paul says, You are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Uh, during your time here on this earth, you will come into contact with more people than you can shake a stick at. You think about it, each and every day, especially if you go to some places where it's crowded, say, look at all these people. What's your effect on them going to be? Will it be a positive one or a negative one? Here Paul says, known and read by all men. Same is true of you. Verse 3, clearly you are an epistle of Christ. A letter written by our Savior. A message penned from the author. He says, ministered by us, the service of the church and other Christians, written not with ink, like these physical epistles, these letters here, but by the Spirit of the living God. And that's the changed material. That's the new man because we've got God living in us, the gift of the Holy Spirit for those who obey the gospel, not on tablets of stone as the old law was, but on tablets of flesh. Christ living in us, our bodies, the temples of the Holy God. That is of the heart. Each one of us is a Christian epistle. The question is, are we going to work as designed? Are we going to function properly? Are we going to have that influence? And this has been a lesson about influence. And I hope you see God's design in the church, in the body. Uh, the nature of Christianity is that it would spread. That we would see Christian men and women making other Christian men and women. Not by any power that's within us, uh, other than that just to influence. Just to nudge, to redirect and say, look to Christ. And those who are following after Christ, living by that doctrine, people see Christ living through us. Uh, so that epistle, a letter, a writing uh, directed to a group of people, especially to teach for their good, for their help. That's us. That's a picture of the church. That's a picture of the Christian. It should be a picture of you and me. Are we followers of God who live up to that responsibility? Uh, to influence others for the good. Uh, to do what we must do to protect that good picture, that good influence. Uh, first of all, we've got to be changed material. Uh, must be converted and converted fully to Christ, devoted to Him. Uh, secondly, we must be from the author, that others would see Christ living in us, that we've got the same value system, the same desires that Christ does. We must be designed to help, to, to be about the good of others. Uh, and that means putting ourselves uh, in a lower position, to be a humble servant. And then also to be easily read. Uh, not hypocritical in our way of doing things, not spotted by the world, uh, not spoiled and not speaking above where people understand, uh, but simply going out and doing the work, making sure that we're reflecting the light of Christ, uh, doing so understanding not just that responsibility, uh, but the joy of that, the honor of that, to say that we can glorify Him because it is a wonderful blessing. Uh, if you're not yet a Christian this morning, you need to become one. Uh, have your sins washed away by coming to Jesus, uh, having them washed in His blood in the waters of baptism, and rise as a new creature, uh, ready to be that epistle, ready to be sent out, uh, to be mailed for the good of the world, uh, to do work in the kingdom. Uh, and if you're a Christian who's been corrupted by the world, uh, maybe you feel that you've lost your influence or you've been too busy influencing for the negative, uh, God is ready to forgive. We're ready to work alongside you. If there's anything we can do for you this morning, we'd invite you to come as together we stand and sing.